All right, and I, I believe, uh, oh, no, you're already doing it. Okay. Previously, I was told to oh, do my well, own recording, but it looks like you've got yes, that handled. You, that That's the default, but if you could uh, press the record button, if you can. Well, I oh, don't, yeah, I don't have a record, like it's a, I can only stop or, uh, yeah, stop the recording. So in okay, the last one so, I hit record and did my own, but this one, yeah, I, I seem yeah, to only be able to same, control what's already happening. Same with the last one for me. That's uh, strange, but either way. Um, so we've got a few well, people already yeah, rushing hello in. Hello, attendees. Andrew, okay. Dirk, and Wesley. Yes. We'll uh, leave it a couple of minutes and let people, because uh, there's quite a few things on, yeah. which is great. Um, but yeah, no, I'm very excited for this one. Well, I, I guess, to... uh, you know, prompted by you, I will, you know, as people trickle in, introduce the real star of today. Yes. The cat, Simon, <laughs> taking his nap. Yes. Uh, oh, got quite a few already. Um, oh, wonderful. I'm just checking the time. Yeah. Give it until 32 and then we'll stop. All right. Otherwise, yeah. I'm coming to everyone from my my lovely office with all my antique maps of the Balkans up on the up on the wall. Are you you're based in Bulgaria, aren't you? Yep. Yes. Yep. In in Sofia? Yep. Or... Oh, cool. Yeah, I remember I vaguely remember you mentioned that early in the podcast. Yep. Yep. Uh moving a few places, but about a year and a half ago, my wife and I bought this lovely 112-year-old uh, apartment that we have since been <laughs> trying to stay sane renovating. Um, oh yes, I know the feeling working with old flats and apartments. Yeah. The, the things that you just try to fix and never can. Right. Uh, yeah. So we'll kick it off now. So um, first, hello everyone. My name is Sam Hume. I am the admin support uh, tech wizard for this session. Um, today for this session we have Eric Halsey. Uh, no, Eric Haley. Sorry, um, Halsey. No, it's. <laughs> Eric has been creating the Bulgarian History Podcast for, well, almost a decade now, since 2013, I think. Yep. Um, he's covered nearly 14 centuries of history over 161 episodes. Eric has degrees in history, political science, and nationalism studies from the University of Mary in Washington and the Central European University. Today, he is presenting How 19th Century Nationalism Chased the Circassians Across the Ottoman World. And I, for one, am very excited for this. So uh, without any further ado, I will step off the stage and let Eric uh, do what he does best. All right, well, hey everybody. You know, greetings from mm, Overcast Sofia. I'm told we might have some hail. So if at some point if you hear a bunch of little dings and things, that would be a hailstorm. but we'll, we'll see if we get through it. So jumping right in. Now, when I was first presented with the topic of crossings for this whole event, I thought a lot about, okay, well, there's been a lot of peoples that have moved in and out of Bulgaria. The Bulgarians have crossed and moved around a lot. But, but you know, one particular group that really came to mind were the Circassians, you know, only tangentially related to Bulgaria and Bulgaria will come into the story at some point. But, you know, sometimes we got to step out of our typical zone, talk about something just because it's so darn interesting. We want an excuse to deep dive into it. So, the Circassians are, or Circassians, sorry, trying to get the pronunciation right, are a, a not very well-known group whose 19th century history contains a tremendous number of literal and metaphorical crossings, as well as functioning as an interesting way to show us how kind of modernity in all its, uh, you know, uglier forms really entered their world. So the Circassians are an indigenous group from the North Caucasus, just north of the modern country of Georgia. So if you remember, for example, the Sochi Olympics, Sochi was once a major Circassian city and their capital for a time. So that gives you a geographic idea of where we are talking about. Now, this story begins with the Russian Circassian War, which lasted 101 years, not bad, from 1763 to 1864, making the Circassians, I'd say maybe arguably the Caucasian group that really put up the most serious fight against Russian expansion into their territory. Now, for a little more context, the Russian Empire and the Kievan Rus before them had both fought the Circassians since the 10th century. So the, that relationship had been going on for a while, sporadic fighting here and there, so nothing new. And the Circassians themselves were originally Christians, having converted in the third century. And so the first kind of border crossing that they made that I want to mention is crossing from the Christian world into the Muslim world, because 
they decided to basically convert to Islam in the 18th century, partially because the Ottoman Empire were trying to kind of convert them. But the real major factor driving that was Russian expansionism. You know, Russia was starting to expand into the Caucasus in the 19th century, and the Circassians saw converting to Islam as the best way to really give them some good allies, particularly the Ottomans. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting. You don't have a lot of cases where an entire group of people convert to a different religion to kind of defend themselves against outside encroachment. And indeed, when the Circassians began converting to Islam in large numbers is the same time that they began to experience major fighting with the expansionist Russian Empire. But in those early years, the Russians weren't really trying to conquer Circassia, they were just raiding. But what exactly drove Russia to expand so aggressively into the Caucasus at this point? In short, it was opportunism, you know, a chance for expansion. The, the land was there. Russia was expanding in nearly all, every direction at this moment. There was the opportunity, particularly of the declining Ottoman Empire, which had previously been very you know, influential in this region. And as we've probably all heard of, the ever-loving kind of desire for warm water ports, uh, in particular here on the Black Sea. So in roughly 1763, a war of expansion broke out between Russia and Circassia. Now, in the first five years, some Circassians wanted to just surrender to avoid war at all costs, but obviously that didn't happen. And by 1768, war had actually broken out between the Russians and the Ottomans, which triggered the Ottoman Sultan to use his position as caliph to call on all Muslims in the Caucasus to rise up and fight the Russians. So, you know, suddenly the Circassians, they've already been fighting a, a more low level war against Russia, but now they've got the Ottomans as kind of allies. Uh, they've got this big call to arms. And in theory, now they've got a bigger unified front to fight the Russians. Bad news is, despite all of this, in 1774, the Russians were victorious, uh, turning Crimea from an Ottoman puppet into a Russian puppet, uh, which deprived Circassia of a potential ally, and Russia gained ports on the Sea of Azov and the Straits of Kirsch, which gave them access to the Black Sea. So ironically enough, though, right, war with the Ottomans is over, war with the Circassians keeps right on going. It's just now they have fewer allies, and Russian influence has expanded even more in their direction due to this victory against the Ottomans. Now, at the same time, from 1770 to, 17, or to 1803, there were a number of uprisings by Circassian farmers against their noble rulers, leading much of the nobility to flee to Russia for refuge, and leading to the establishment of a few kind of autonomous republics within Circassia. So here's another kind of interesting crossing, sort of the Circassians crossing first from the Christian to the Islamic world. Now they're kind of making that shift from autocratic noble-led governments to some you know, democratic republics. Ironically, at the same time, the French Revolution was going uh, uh, underway. So it's a bit funny, right? We think of the, the French Revolution kicking off all these uh, kind of liberal or not so liberal revolutions around Europe. But here you actually have one happening at the same time in the Caucasus. And so it kind of it shows how, you know, let's say modernity is encroaching the form of like imperialist Russian expansionist powers, but also in people's ideas that, hey, you know, I think we can actually overthrow our nobles and run things for ourselves pretty well. Now, in these decades, though, Russia is slowly tightening the noose around Circassia. They annexed Crimea, turning it from a puppet into part of their territory. They annexed Georgia. And with these, they basically managed to almost surround Circassia. And by the early 19th century, Russia also began shifting its strategy towards the Circassians. And they shifted towards a policy of basically terror and genocide. Previously, it was more kind of standard uh, 18th century warfare. Now it's, you know, modern colonial uh, genocidal kind of warfare. I want to quote a Russian general, Ivan Petrovich Del Pozzo, who wrote about the Circassian forces, quote, this time I'm eliminating myself on this. In the future, I will have no mercy for the guilty brigands. Their villages will be destroyed, properties taken, wives and children will be slaughtered, end quote. So that gives you a bit of, a bit of an idea about how Russia was starting to feel about uh, the, the Circassians a couple decades into their fighting with them. They're, they're done playing nice and now they're shifting towards, you know, extreme brutality. And so at this point, 
the Russians employ tactics that would soon become familiar from colonial occupying wars around the world. Instead of just building fortresses or, or doing other things to control the population, they shifted towards a policy of overwhelming retribution. If an attack, a raid, murder of someone, any resistance happened in a local population, that population would fail, face wholesale executions, the destruction of crops, the destruction of villages, you know, overwhelming retribution. And so the Circassians found themselves facing these inhuman brutalities of modern warfare in which states had the resources and the inclination to literally remake the environment itself. I mean, reading about this, I was reminded of the way the US Army used Agent Orange in the Vietnam War to kind of destroy jungles so the Viet Cong wouldn't have places to fight. And the Russian army did something similar. They would destroy and burn down entire forests so the Circassian rebels would have nowhere to hide. So this, you know, suddenly the, the, the power of these larger, more organized modern states is really making itself felt to literally reshape the earth in order to basically destroy this uh, group of people and to take over their territory. Another increasingly common tactic was to resettle Circassians so they could be separated from their countrymen and better controlled, another common colonial tactic. And when resettlement freed up land, the Russians would generally take allied Cossacks and settle them on that land. So again, this is the, the kind of genocide aspect of not, you know, murdering wholesale groups of people, but also trying to eliminate uh, a national group by removing them from their land, settling other people there, and just that being a way to take over that land. Uh, so I'd say arguably at this point, you could say the Circassians are experiencing, again, that, that transition from early modern warfare, you know, Napoleonic era warfare, into something more modern, recognizable, kind of colonial to us. Now, 1806 saw another Russo-Turkish war begin, meaning, hooray, the Circassians suddenly have Ottoman support. They've got an ally again. The Ottoman Sultan again called for a holy war against the Russians. And as a result of all of this, both the Ottomans and the British, because they hated the Russians at this time, began supply, supplying the Circassians with weapons to aid their resistance. But unfortunately for them, six years later, the Ottomans were once again on the losing side, but at least not a lot changed in the Caucasus. So this particular war with the Ottomans didn't result in major changes in those borders. Uh, essentially, the Ottomans gave up their claim on Russian-controlled Georgia in exchange for keeping some uh, southern parts of Georgia to themselves. And so for the Circassians, it meant mostly just losing foreign support once again. Now, jumping ahead to the Treaty of 1829, the Treaty of Adrianople ended yet another brief Russo-Turkish war. And this time, the Ottomans agreed to hand Circassia over to Russia. And this is an interesting thing to be in a treaty because, of course, the Ottomans didn't control Circassia. Uh, and so in practice, it really just meant the Ottomans accepted that the Russians could have the territory, that they weren't going to contest it. Uh, and here we have an example of that classic practice of great power, sort of giving someone territory without consulting the locals. And even if they don't necessarily control it, just, uh, what just happened? Ah, okay, hosted something. So in 1848, the Circassians and a few other Caucasian peoples were kind of united under an imam and formed a more united front against the Russians. And this, no surprise, triggered more, even more brutal retaliation against locals by Russian forces. And soon in 1853, the outbreak of the Crimean War meant that once again, the Circassians had foreign allies to help in their fight against Russia. Except the Ottomans really wanted Circassia to be more of a vassal than an ally and refused to work with the new Circassian leader unless he pledged loyalty to them, and he didn't feel like doing that. So when the Crimean War ended in 1886, Russia finally gained at least de jure control over Circassia, despite having lost the war, basically Britain, you know, the British had fought for Circassian independence, they wanted it, but ultimately, you know, they weren't willing to stick their necks that far out in order to obtain that. And so, again, despite Russia losing the, the war in Crimea, they still were able to kind of get foreign recognition for control over Circassia, even though the fighting continued. But by now, more prominent Russians were arguing that you know, this has gone on for long enough. And at this point, conquering Circassia is not enough. That in or that the Circassians were sort of rebels, they were brigands, they could never be controlled, they were barbarians, etc. The only response was to exterminate them. And indeed, by the time the Circassian genocide ended in the 1870s, estimates are 75 to 90% of them were killed, which comes out to about 800 
to uh, 800,000 to 1.5 million people. And you know, by this point, right, by the 1870s, the Russians essentially offer the Circassians a choice. They can flee to the Ottoman Empire or they can be exterminated. One of those Circassian armies actually chose mass suicide instead of having to surrender to the Russians. So you get an idea of just how intensely uh, the, the dislike was there and, and frankly, owing to the brutality that Circassians were not willing to surrender out of fear for what would happen to them. So over the course of the 19th century, hundreds of thousands of Circassians did migrate into the Ottoman Empire. Around a quarter of a million settled in Bulgaria and the Balkans. And soon they represented about five to seven population, five to seven percent of the population of the region. So this is a case where the Ottomans were sort of callously using this migration as a way to increase the Muslim population of the Balkans and thereby make them easier to control. And this, you know, once the Circassians settled in the Balkans, you know, these are people, these are refugees, right? They're literally fleeing genocide. However, the sad reality is that once they get there, they are badly mistreated by Bulgarians. Not because the Bulgarians hate Circassians necessarily, but you know, the Bulgarians associate them with the Ottomans, their incoming Muslims. And vice versa, the Circassians badly mistreat local Bulgarians when they settle there because they associate the Orthodox Bulgarians with the Orthodox Russians that have been killing them for nearly a century at this point. And so when the Circassians are sent to settle the Balkans by the Ottomans, it triggers this, I mean, to me, really profoundly tragic cycle of violence, where each side associates the other side, even though they're both kind of the losers of this point period of history and in a bad shape, they each associate the other side with their oppressors and therefore badly mistreat them. So this goes on until the Bulgarians begin their April uprising against the Ottomans in 1876. Many Circassians are killed in that fighting and the brutal retributions and the back and forth massacres of that uprising. Then when another Russo-Turkish war happens and Bulgaria wins its partial independence in 1878, most of the Circassians living in Bulgarian territory decide, okay, you know, now Bulgaria is occupied by Russia. We should probably go, right? We, we don't want to be living in territory that Russia controls. So they settle in what is now Turkey and Jordan, where most of the descendants of Circassians live today. So kind of wrapping up here, historian Walter Richmond wrote how, quote, Circassia was a small independent nation on the northeastern shore of the Black Sea. For no other reason than ethnic hatred, over the course of hundreds of raids, the Russians drove the Circassians from their homeland and deported them to the Ottoman Empire. At least 600,000 people lost their lives to massacre, starvation, and the elements, while hundreds of thousands more were forced to leave their homeland. By 1864, three-fourths of the population was annihilated, and the Circassians had become one of the first stateless people in modern history." End quote. So wrapping up and tying it back in, that's kind of the last of those brutal crossings for the Circassians. They crossed from the Christian world into the Islamic world in an attempt to seek protection from an aggressive foreign power. From the pre-modern Caucasus world, they moved into the brutal modernity of Russian colonial expansionism and genocide. They crossed the Black Sea to flee that genocide and found themselves part of an Ottoman world rapidly westernizing and transitioning from a kind of feudal Ottoman state into modern European national states. And that process of transitioning into kind of modern European national states forced the Circassians to flee once again, uh, to flee that European modernity which viewed them as rebels, bandits, backward Orientals, Muslims, all these things that the people living in that region did not like. And you know, flee into the non-European parts of the Ottoman Empire where their descendants live today. So as a whole, I would argue that the Circassians were, you know, they were victims of the modern ideas of nations, nationalism, empire, Orientalism, all these forces, colonialism. These ideas and the people using them were forced the Circassians to make many crossings between religious and cultural spheres, overseas and mountains, and ultimately into an existence as a permanently stateless and exiled people which is what they are, unfortunately, today. So now I'm going to open things up for questions. That is my kind of talking part. I think I hit right about 20 minutes. I think, yeah, pretty much. That was uh, some fantastic timekeeping. So yes, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can either leave it in the chat and I'll read it out. Or if you are mic'd up and you want to speak uh, yourself, just put your raise your hand with the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen and uh, I'll call on you and give you permission to do so. Um, but while we're waiting for them to come through, I thought the the conversion initially from uh, Orthodox Christianity to uh, Islam is 
very interesting. The idea that this was a tactical decision almost, or maybe strategic decision um, taken by everyone. I'm kind of, I'm really curious about that. Do we know much about it? Is it well sourced or is this, the way you make, uh, made it seem was that this was not like the same way that rulers convert and then enforce that conversion on their people. It seems more not democratic, that's the wrong way, but mass led. Do we, what do we know about this? So I don't know a lot of the details about it because I, I'm not like a super expert in the, in the Circassians, but you know, my background in nationalism studies and things, you know, would say most likely, yeah, probably top down, you know, the, 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 it's not like everyday farmers were thinking, you know, we really need better allies to protect against the Russians. I think we should convert to Islam. Yeah. That's not the kind of thinking everyday people goes, go with usually, but I think it does tie into a very interesting element of national identities that, you know, from today's perspective, it's so easy for us to look backwards and assume that people in the past had the same relationship towards uh, national identities that we have, but they didn't. You know, people have always throughout history seen uh, elements of their identity, usually as, as tools, as, as things to do something. And so I imagine for most everyday Circassians, like religion was important, but uh, not being dead and not being conquered was probably more important to them. So I did think it's an interesting example. We often like to assume that someone's religion or someone's national identity, surely nothing could be more important than that. Surely they would die to protect that. But often people are practical. And, you know, if you give them the right incentives, they say, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say that I'm this other nationality. Okay, I'll, I'll convert to this religion if you make the incentives right, whether that's at the tip of a sword or just I get better tax incentives or something like that. Looks like we got a question. Yes, we've had quite a few come in. I'll just go through uh, them as they came in. Um, Wesley Livesey uh, asked a question that I was also considering asking. Um, he says, given their turbulent history, is there a modern Circassian group identity? No, there is. I mean, there, there are still, you know, people who identify as Circassians, you know, they still have cultural traditions and, and, and things like that. They are just, you know, a stateless people. There, there's no country associated with them, much like, you know, you think the Jewish people before Israel, or you know, there's, there's a lot of other kind of stateless groups, uh, something blanking, I'm thinking of other examples, but I know there's plenty out there. Um, but, but yeah, so they don't have, you know, a formal government structure, even, you know, someone like within the, the modern Russian Federation, you know, there's uh, groups that have their own kind of federal states, but as far as I'm aware, there's nothing like that for them. So they are just purely kind of carried on uh, through kind of associations, cultural traditions and things like that. Uh, just to follow on from, from Wesley's question, do you know if there's um, any, are they politically active? Is where, whether the, this diaspora, do they have I don't know political parties. Is there agitation for a return to uh, the Caucasus? So is that present? I mean, not not that I'm aware of, but like I doubt that there would be much of a possibility for that. I mean, I, you know, I think they they understand that the possibility of them genuinely going back into uh, you know what's now Russia uh, and sort of reclaiming that as their territory is not going to go well. Mm. Uh, I mean, literally, you know, Putin's what billion dollar mansion uh, that Navalny famously made the documentary about on the Black Sea. I mean, that mansion is in what was Circassia. You know, Russia is not giving that up. There, there's they're, they're not going to have any success. Uh, and again, virtually no Circassians still live in that territory. It's been entirely Russified and, and resettled. Uh, so I don't think there's there's much hope for that. And I don't think the Circassians are big enough in any of the successor states where they live now to really form a, a major political party. I mean, like I said, mostly they live in places like Turkey and Jordan, but you know they're probably not even one percent of the population in those places. And so it's it's they're not big enough to really warrant having a, a, a kind of political force behind them. Okay, um, great answer. So, Jorge, again, I, I, he asked a question in the last session I uh, hosted, and I again, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Jorge asks, uh, he says, greetings from Brazil. You mentioned that they are, they are in the Middle East now. Do they preserve some roots of culture? Can we identify them today as a specific group? Yes, they, they do. They, they, I, in fact, I think, um, I think Ben, for the, the image for this event, uh, posted a picture of like a, a Circassian kind of cultural festival happening. So they, they absolutely do still preserve that. Um, but, you know, that, that's all it is. You know, you imagine like local cultural festivals and, and events like that. Uh, God, it's on the tip of my tongue. There, there's, there's a group that was based on Iran that I, a friend uh, was descended from that uh, reminds me of that. And it's a similar thing, like a, a stateless people, but I just cannot remember. But continue with the questions. Maybe it'll come back <laughs> in my head and I'll give that an example. Uh, Eric, uh, Trometer, I hope. Uh, how much of Russia's decision to go 
to a salted earth policy after Crimea had to do with the outdated and disorganized Russian military the Crimean War exposed. I mean, that's connected to, to me. It's not, not as a was It's not like Russia did badly in Crimea, and so they decided to change tactics in Circassia. Uh, I think, you know, remember by that point, they'd been fighting nearly a century in Circassia. So, you know, my impression reading the sources I read was that they're just sick and tired of this problem. Like they've been trying to conquer this territory. They've been trying to stamp out uh, any resistance and, and fully annex it. But the Circassians just keep fighting, you know, guerrilla tactics, sometimes full on army, sometimes guerrilla tactics. And eventually the Russians get tired uh, of playing, you know, quote unquote, Mr. Nice Guy, and they shift to more and more brutal tactics, which again, I think you look at the history of colonialism, that's a, a very common thing in, in kind of colonial wars, wars of conquest in that, in that manner, that if the locals continue to resist in things, eventually the occupiers, the invaders get more and more brutal, so. Fair question, fair answer. Um, Preston Palmer asks, have the Circassians left any cultural legacy on Bulgaria? Where, uh, were there any important Circassians that left an impact on Bulgaria? So not, not that I'm aware of, but mostly because the Circassians were really only in Bulgaria for a couple of years. So it was a fairly short period of time. I mean, there are still some descendants, like there's a few that didn't leave, but you know, having lived in this country for nearly 10 years and, you know, traveled all around and you know, writing about it, researching and things, uh, I, I've never encountered a mention of Circassians in Bulgaria, except in history books, because, yeah, again, you know, the, you would look like 1860s, 1870s, more in the 1870s, particularly that that Circassians settled in Bulgaria. And by 1878, Russia was in control of Bulgaria after the Russo-Turkish War, and the Circa, uh, Circassians could see like, okay, it's time for us to go. So you're looking at like maximum a decade. So it's just not not a long enough to, to leave a, a more lasting cultural legacy, I think. That's really interesting. Um, just the, the thinking about uh, the Ottomans and the Caucasus, they have a somewhat uh, tarnished uh, history. Mm -hmm. um, was there any kind of, again, it's, this is not really the topic of your talk, but the Armenian genocide and all that, um, mm -hmm. that that policy that that, uh, that the Ottomans took during the war is there basically is there is is the violence of the Russian policy mm -hmm. against Circassia um, special in any way? Was it would it have been seen by neighboring uh, the Ottoman Empire as like oh now that's that's a harsh approach, but that seems to have worked? Is there do we see any kind of awful cross-pollination of ideas for how to suppress uh, yeah. minorities within the territory. It's very interesting because, I mean, you know, the, the Ottomans had, you know, later the, the Armenian genocide uh, a few decades after this. You know, I, I've never seen anyone reference that, but I suppose it's, it's quite possible that, pardon me, that senior Ottoman officials could have seen that as like, okay, you know, this was brutal, but it worked, you know. There's no denying from the Russian perspective it worked. Russia is in full control of what used to be Circassia. There's, you know, they, you know, were effective enough at uh, ruthlessly murdering and exterminating them as a group of people that, you know, by all accounts, seems Russia will control that territory forever because there's nearly no one to contest it anymore. And so I wouldn't be that surprised if the Ottomans did take some level of inspiration, but Obviously, it'd be very hard to tell because the Ottomans and the, the Turkish state have done a lot to make sure it's as difficult as possible to understand the, the origins and thinking behind the Armenian genocide. They don't want people to, to know anything about that. So, yeah, it, it would be rather tricky, but it seems quite, quite plausible to me. Interesting. Um, do we have any further questions? Remember, you can put them in Q&A. You can raise your hand if you, if you can't quite work out a way to word the question and talking might be easier. I can allow you to speak um, or you can just put it in the chat um because we i mean we've still got 10 minutes so there is plenty of time um while we're seeing if uh, there's any further questions uh, eric was there anything that you wanted to talk about but you you had to cut because you were worried about time i mean i guess just uh, maybe more more of the the kind of just general discussion of of the the these kinds of crossings and 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 maybe maybe i could dive a little bit into this this like 
I mentioned this, this horrible, really ironic um, retribution when, when the Circassians entered Bulgaria, because it was actually another similar story where the same thing happened with the Tatars, that, you know, when Russia initially conquered Crimea, uh, quite a few Tatars left as refugees and were settled again by the Ottomans in Bulgaria as a way to increase the, the Muslim population of Bulgaria and make it easier to control that, that kind of vital Ottoman controlled territory. And again, you know, you have Tatars that are literally refugees uh, fleeing the destruction and conquest of their homeland, but to the Bulgarians uh, that they, you know, come into, these are people who are now like kind of stealing their land, uh, suddenly just settling amongst them, and are, are again, in the eyes of Bulgarians, they're tools of the Ottoman oppressor. And, and so... It, to me, it's just, it's mind-bogglingly cruel for the Ottomans to kind of take these refugees and then use them as a, a kind of political tool of control and turn those refugees into the target of, you know, retribution and attacks by the people that they're using them to kind of attack and control. Uh, I mean, it, it makes the way many contemporary politicians use refugees in a callous way for political aims look uh, positively uh, friendly uh, by comparison, I'd say. And so, it was a thing the Ottomans did, not just with the Circassians, but with also the Tatars with a very similar story. And again, it just it, it just struck me as so so tragic because I sympathize with the Bulgarians, right? That that these are foreigners that uh, are tools of their oppressors that are suddenly settling on their lands. They don't like that, and they don't want these people to be there. And so you know they're mad at them for that. Whereas the poor you know Tatars and Circassians. You know, th this is the only, they didn't have another choice. It's not like they, they had a long list of options of where they could go. And they said, ah, let's go to Bulgaria. We'll, we'll go beat up on the locals or something. No, this was where they were sent. Uh, and so, yeah, just, it's just a, a, an, an astonishingly tragic set of circumstances. Um, I see we have, I think, another question. Yes. Just before we get onto that, uh, Steve asks, are you trying to remember the Kurds in Iraq? I think he's referring to the, your friend, like yeah. the, that, was it the Kurds? No, no, the, the, that, that's another good one. No, the, the Kurds are obviously, I, actually, I think, technically speaking, I think I've read that the Kurds are the largest stateless people in the world at this point. The, the I, largest... think I've, I think I've seen something similar. Yeah. Um, but no, this is, um, gosh, it's, uh, uh, it's like, it's one of the, uh, um, wait, Ah, like I think uh, it was the, the language that they spoke in the, that uh, weird Mel Gibson, Jesus Christ movie. It's like Aramaic. Yeah, yeah. What was the? I, I think yeah, I'm thinking of the the group that that language came from. Like, uh, but I'm yeah. Again, I just <laughs> I'm 33 now, and my my memory is not what it used to be. And occasionally, I just <laughs> cannot make my brain remember these things. But, anyways, it's rather tangential. In any case, um, uh, Mark but, Lemp uh, Lemp says, uh, "Just want to say this is dense and fascinating, and also sad. Completely agree. Uh, do any of do you have any other interests in these types these type stories?" Hang on, I, it's, I was going to say it's a long day, but it's, the conference has only just begun. Uh, do you have any other interests in these type of stories or areas of history? And he says it's an incredible presentation, which, yes, oh, again, agree. I mean, yeah, this is all, <laughs> it's all uh, you know, fascinating to me. Obviously, I'm, I'm someone who chose to live in Bulgaria and as an American from Washington, D.C. to make my life here. So I, I find these histories fascinating. And, you know, if, if there's another part of the world that I find you know, number two fascinating after the Balkans, it's definitely the Caucasus. Uh, you know, I've, I've been to, to Georgia and, and just absolutely love that country. And, you know, I feel like I've debated once I finish the Bulgarian history podcast, God knows how long that'll take. It's almost 10 years in and I'm only in the 1890s. Uh, the aim is to go to the modern period. But, you know, I thought, oh, maybe I could do some kind of Caucasus history because it's just a, a fascinating region. So personally, I just, I like stories that are complicated, that are kind of messy and not uh, easily kind of cut up, sliced, characterized, and like, oh, here's how it was. And I feel like this is a, a fairly messy, complicated story, but it's it's also, you know, the again, the Circassian story, was, I was drawn to it because, you know, I, again, in Bulgarian history, in my podcast, they're briefly mentioned, just a, a very, very small side note. But, you know, once I did a little more digging, it's like, okay, this is a yeah profoundly sad, but a, a really fascinating story. And Again, thinking about crossings, it just felt like these are people that that cross so many, as I, as I said in the intro, physical borders, metaphorical borders, uh, a group of people that were really sort of, I'd say, victims of modernity, of, of modern warfare, of modern ideas of identity and nation, just on the, the losing end of a lot of, uh, you know, large historical forces. I think that's that's 
pretty on point. Uh, don't worry, Mark. It's you, it wasn't you writing it wrong. It's just me not being able to read. Um, just before we we finish up, um, I did have a thought that when you mentioned uh, that the Russians used the Cossacks to they they planted friendly Cossacks on Circassian territory, and that just made me think of oh yeah no the Cossacks they're you know a, a special uh, military. Uh, use for for the Russian state was did the Circassians have a similar reputation? Were they did the Ottomans hire them as mercenaries? Did the uh, did they have a particular apart from you know they held off a great power for a hundred years? Um, how was their military reputation? So I think like just about all the peoples of the Caucasus, at least in my estimation, they did have a reputation as as very fierce warriors. I mean, if you if you've been to the Caucasus, like it's it's a it's a place that you can understand why it breeds uh, very very tough and kind of fearsome people. Um, I mean, Circassians did fight in Ottoman armies. You know, they they were occasionally used as mercenaries. Again, once they kind of settled in the Ottoman Empire, they they were simply part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, you know. I mentioned in the past that the Ottomans had an interesting evolving relationship with them. They were kind of an ally at some point. And so, you know, again, when the Ottomans fought, say, the Russians, Circassians would fight alongside them. And yeah, without a doubt, the, the, the Circassians in general just had a fearsome reputation. I mean, you know, they, they held off the Russian Empire for 101 years, which, you know, that, that, that's a feat in any case. Um, you know, there's not, not many wars in world history that lasted that long. There's a few, but... Uh, yeah, I was surprised when when first kind of deep diving into this topic that I hadn't really heard of this war. I hadn't heard even heard of this genocide. Like I, I uh, in university, I worked for a, a genocide kind of monitoring NGO. I took courses and and worked closely with uh, some genocide scholars and specialists. Like, you know, for a while in university, genocide was my specialty, and I had never heard of this one. And this was very surprising to me because by the standards, the legal definitions and the understandings of genocide, this is a very clear cut one. You know, the people who did it were not mincing words about what their goal was. And you know, tragically, they were largely successful. Uh, and so that really drew me to this topic of you know, the, the length of that war, this you know, little known, uh, little talked about genocide and, and all those things, yeah, just made it, uh, I think something, despite how profoundly sad it is, uh, something that was worth kind of highlighting in this talk. I think it's absolutely, I'm really glad that you did pick this topic because again, I had no, I knew about the Circassians, but like I said, before we began, I wasn't entirely sure how to pronounce it. Um, but it's again, fascinating, fascinating story. And I'm glad uh, that you've, you've taught us about it. So before we finish off, um, if people want to hear more from you, uh, where can they find the history of Bulgaria? Very easy. People always ask me, where, where can I find your podcast? If you Google the Bulgarian history podcast, like you'll find it. <laughs> we're, we're the only <laughs> one. We, it's just me. Uh, so yeah, very easy to find on, on yeah, all the podcast platforms, social media and everywhere. I'm not that big on social media because I just do too much with my, my time and things and I'm not that much of a fan of it. But uh, yeah, if you, even if you want to, anyone wants to get in touch, has a question or something, you know, you can find my contacts through the, the Facebook page, through Twitter, uh, email and things like that. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm a, li a little bit sick. <laughs> Doctors tell me it's just stress that I'm like not 100%. My voice is a bit messed up. So yeah, I'm glad I had enough of a voice to do this. I was very worried that I'd be a little too hoarse and everything. So I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and for uh, giving this presentation. It's really, really good. As you can see, everyone's, everyone's really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, enjoy. Are you going to be uh, taking part in anything else um, today or are so you going to... So I just did uh, uh, my panel. So like my two things were just before this and now, but I'll try to watch a few while I just kind of rest. It's uh, after 7 p.m. here. So I got to go have some dinner. And <laughs> But uh, I'll hopefully be able to chill a bit and just uh, be a, a viewer for the, some yeah. of the remaining. Rest, rest your voice. <laughs> <laughs> got to record two podcast episodes by the end of the month. So I got to make sure I'm in <laughs> decent shape. In which case, I will leave you to go and recuperate. Thank you so Thanks. much. Uh, again, anyone wants to listen to your podcast, it's the Bulgarian History Podcast. And like you say, stick it in Google. Uh, yeah. It's the only one. And uh, yeah, yeah I know, I'm a huge fan of it myself. Anyway, ah. thank you very much. Thank you everyone right. for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Okay. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much.